man. I can't find a seconder usually when I propose this, but I don't care. I don't need a seconder. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. Wise words from Christopher Hitchens. <clears throat> first things first, Alabama State Bar Rules of Professional Conduct Rule 7.2e requires the following language in all attorney communications. No representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed is greater than the quality of legal so- services performed by other lawyers. I'm Harry Steele, Backwood Southern Lawyer. My partner in crime, Paul Rip, is here. And... If the bail bondsman comes through, Reigns may join us via telephone. We don't know what he's up to. Uh, but I did want to give everybody an update and let them know that um, I have moved my office to Daphne to the Van Buren building. It's located at 28720 Highway 98, Suite 3. So, Paul. And the podcast be located there, too. Let's hope if the city will get out there and get all their inspections done, we'll get our biz- business license and and get that going too. All right. So, Paul, get us kicked off. Go for it. All right. Uh, we uh, encourage uh, people to send us uh, any information that they can, and we're in receipt of some of that. But before we're I get, in receipt of some plutonium. Yeah, really. But uh, one of the things that I want to say first is thank you very much to some people that have contributed to us lately. Uh, it helps tremendously. The RIP Report is nonprofit. And uh, we personally finance it, so anything we get that like that helps us a lot. We've got a couple of contributors that really come through for us in the last couple of years, so thank you again. Uh, the one thing that we did get, uh, January 2nd, 2020, I got an eight-page letter, uh, anonymous letter, because uh, in Baldwin County, if you put your name on it, you could be harassed to death, but... This letter is, appears to be extremely well written, and uh, it's a financial, it's titled Financial Instability and Mismanagement of Funds at Coastal Alabama Community College and Corruption in the Alabama Community College System. Now, uh, pa- so we already have an anonymous letter that I went over a few weeks ago. Correct. And if you've been following us, we talked about this back in November, and then last week we talked about another thing we're following up on related to the now defunct Southwest Alabama Police Academy. So here we go again with an anonymous letter um, about Coastal. So and, go, keep going. Paul. And this is this is eight pages. I'll be forwarding this to the uh, district attorney. Uh, I won't be holding my breath, but I will forward it to him. Uh, and it's addressed to the Board of Trustees. Now, you know, rather than go through the whole eight pages, what I'd like to do is go through one thing that – I think is very jarring. It states, it appears the chancellor is using our college funds to pay excessive and seemingly inflated legal fees to his former employer, the Han Arendal Harrison Sale Law Firm, uh, over $300,000 to Han Arendal. Between 2010 and 2018, legal fees were $166,410.25. Since the chancellor, Mr. Bates, and Han Arendal has taken over the college, the college has paid more state funds on legal fees in one year, $316,156.73, than the amount paid in the previous nine years, which was $166,410.25, when the chancellor replaced the previous college Council with Hand Arendal, the college's legal fees increased $274,497 from the previous year. That's a 759% increase. And we, and we talked about this last time um, about how professional services do not fall under the public bid law. If you have, if you're an attorney, if you're a professional engineer, and if, if you're an architect, if you're a, uh, um, anyone with a professional license in the state of Alabama, typically is exempt from the bid law. Okay. Well, these fees are outrageous. Now, let me let me well, go. Well, it's somebody's job to review them, right? 
I well, mean, and we're talking about figures. We don't know if this is true. Correct, correct. We're reading this. This is what we've gotten. But I will tell you what I do know. I do know that in Fairhope, Hand Arendahl is the one that handled the triangle lawsuit. And at one city council meeting that I was present at, Hand Arendahl addressed the council, turned around to the audience, held his hand up and said, I'm telling you, you will owe no legal fees because we're going to win the case and all legal fees are going to be paid to us from the other side. Folks, that didn't happen. We lost almost $3 million. We lost the lawsuit. We had to buy the property for eight point two. I mean, was it like a Braveheart speech? Uh, yeah, it, it like, really was. I, in fact, to tell you the truth, when I heard him say and pledge that, pledge that, I was very surprised because I'd never heard an attorney ever speak like that in my life. So I know those fees were outrageous, and the city got stuck with them. And it's still not over because now there are people that are trying to take that property, the same triangle property, and turn it into a conservation easement. But I'm not going to get into that right now. We'll come, we'll come back to that. Um, but this is a complaint that somebody needs to read. I'm, I'm going to send it to the district attorney. I'm hoping he already has that. If anybody is on uh, staff or on the board of trustees, I would look at those law firm uh, expenses. And if these figures that I am reading are correct, it is totally outrageous. Well, you got to remember, they got paid to be a consultant on these consolidations. <clears throat> oh, well, I just know my experience in Fairhope. And uh, I wouldn't wouldn't be my choice of firms. And if it was, I would want an accounting billing for every single minute that they worked. Um, that's one uh, complaint. And then another th that we will put on the uh, we'll put it on the backstory podcast too, to where you can read it. Uh, the second one is there's a lot of people, some people in Fairhope that uh, you know they they. They think that everything is surrounding a conspiracy theory, and one of them is the um, complaint that was filed against Councilman uh, Robert Brown. This involves the um, Eastern Shore Arts Center. Uh, Mr. Brown contends long and short of the story is that he had permission from the Ethics Commission and that there were other bidders. There was no letter from the Ethics Commission giving him permission, and there was no other bidders. And if there was, he can come forth with those and clear up the whole matter but this 45 page complaint is going to be again on the uh backstory podcast there's a lot of backstory information in the complaint that goes all the way back to the complaint involving the uh airport and the president of the council jack burrell and the same cast of characters uh but people need to read the complaint read it cover to cover and then tell us what you think uh, the next thing is uh, Fairhope again, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, this is a Lanyap article. This this Lanyap that uh, came out this week I thought was particularly good. There's 10 or 11 real good articles in there. Uh, I hope people understand in Lanyap you can go to the back and there's all types of uh, uh, venues for music, entertainment. It's not only political and short articles. Um and it is probably the only good substantial news that you're going to get in Baldwin County. But for what it's worth, it was written by Gabe Times, and it's where Fairhope City Council purchases the uh, landmark clock corner. This has been going on now since about August of last year. So did they, con they didn't condemn it? They just uh, came up with a – how exactly do you put a value on that corner? I'll tell you how you put a value on that corner. First, the – lead negotiator the main man negotiator jack burrell who couldn't negotiate himself out of a wet paper bag uh and the council do you not like I, council president burrell? I, I, I think burrell is the most dangerous politician in the county i mean what he's caused fair hope few people know but anyway what happened the backstory again to this is this gentleman uh matt bowers uh paid 1.3 million dollars for the corner and wanted to build a boutique hotel. He made application, uh, went through all the song and dance. And to that get sounds it. like that 
conforms with their comprehensive plan. That's the center of the village, right? Correct. Section Street and Fairhope Avenue. Correct. Yeah. And and the and the small piece of land that we're talking about around the clock, there were many people that really thought the city already uh, owned the property. Now the backstory is that years ago. The city council and the mayor, many years ago, the city council and mayor failed to buy the property on two different occasions because it cost too much. Okay, so this time this gentleman comes in and he wants to build a boutique hotel, and before long it goes totally sideways between the, uh, the council and the owner and the architect and the uh, owner. Uh, Shocking. Yeah, and the owner eventually accuses the council of blackmail, and he doesn't trust any of them, and I don't blame him one bit. But anyway, so they go to... Another so, lesson learned. Yeah, so so then they go to... Uh, they go to him after all of this problem and tell him, say, okay, well, we'll can we buy it from you? Now, he paid $1.3 million for the entire thing. They, so he wanted five hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, which was non-negotiable, and this is about fifteen hundred square foot. So we end up splitting this with the um, uh, single tax, but it is ridiculous with what the city, what the council is buying, and the way that they are acquiring stuff, and then they can't do anything with it. Now, I thought what the mayor said in the end should remind people and make them reflect on what's going on. What the city, this is the mayor, what the city has been doing is we buy property and we do nothing with it. Other recent purchases have been the 114 acres on the corner of County Road 32 and 13 for future park facilities. We'll be getting into that in a minute. For $2.65 million. They can't do anything with it. The Fairhope K-1 Center... They're having to f put on a temporary roof on it because they don't have the money to do anything with it. The and City Hall is about down. to fall down around their ears, City too, right? City Hall, uh, the Nick Center, the adjacent park, Bayou Drive, two and a half million, and Dias in the Dias Triangle, which we just talked about, which was 875, and I'm glad to see it is a legal settlement. They're still trying to convince, council's still trying to convince everybody they bought it. For a park, they didn't. It was a legal settlement. But um, not that it shouldn't have been bought, but if somebody had negotiated it the right way and treated the owner the right way, I can assure you that it would have not cost anywhere near that amount. And uh, this was not... The alternative is he puts a hog farm right there at the corner of section. Uh, well, <laughs> I, can, I can assure you they probably were, were within 10 minutes of having a lawsuit filed against them, by the way, that... Uh, they did treat the man, and uh, they were trying to tell him what and when and how they that he could do with his property, and I think that's what encouraged him to sell it, is just get them out of his hair, so I don't blame him. Ready? Yeah. All right, so we're going to run a trailer for you guys, and we'll be right back. It is ordered, adjudged, and decreed that Walter McMillan is to face death by electrocution. This is my dad, sir. Sit down, young man. John, I want you to sit down now. He ain't do nothing wrong. Please, Judge, hold on one second. I won't say it again. Sit down. Not if you're going to kill my dad for no reason. You killing my family, sir, you! They convicted an innocent man. I was always taught to fight for the people who need the help the most. You don't know what it is down here. They ain't got to have no evidence. How many of you all were with Walter that morning? You ain't quitting, is you? No, sir. We all with you. I don't want my son growing up knowing his mom stopped doing what was right just because she was scared. I think we could build a case strong enough to bring them home. And I'm not gonna stop until I've done that. Let's get to work.
life is still meaningful. And I'm gonna do everything possible to keep them from taking it. All right. So it is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. weekend. His birthday is recognized as a national holiday. And of course, it's observed this coming Monday. Um, the original trial in this case was moved right here to Baymanet in Baldwin County, even though the murder happened in uh, Monroeville in Monroe County. Um, so, Paul, the last time we we talked about this, um, I asked you what you thought about the former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court's involvement in this Just Mercy case. And uh, I, I went and saw the movie Diddlin' I did this weekend. And, um, of course, when you watch the movie, Tommy Chapman, who is who, who was not involved in the original prosecution at all, he followed the, uh, the district attorney who did prosecute um, in uh, Conecuh, Monroe, uh, district so he's re- he's the darth vader character in the movie he's the one that you see transform and they change his mind and he becomes a good guy in the end um they did not show anything about the first trial and i felt like maybe i had been a little hard on on our former chief justice so uh i went and uh and i think we have a graphic of the page from the novel uh, page 239 of search, Circumstantial Evidence, Death, Life, and Justice in, in a Small Southern Town, a novel by Pete Early that won the Ed, Edgar Allan Poe Award for Best Fact Crime Book. So I'm saying I'm sure this thing's been vetted, right? I mean, I haven't read the transcript from the trial. Um, but if anybody has that laying around, please get it to us because I'll read it beginning to end. Um According to the book, um, they had put a witness on the stand, and after cross-examination, she leapt to her feet and said, I have one more question. Tell me who is Karen Kelly. And um, before the objection could come, the witness said, well, she's that white woman that's been uh, that's his girlfriend. And, of course, the judge sustained the, uh, sustained the objection, but the jury had already heard it. So, how do you feel about her serving on the Alabama Ethics Commission? I think that's the right spot for someone like that. Okay. <laughs> Knowing the history of the Ethics Commission. <laughs> no other comment? <clears throat> uh, I, I mean, I just, I just think it's unbelievable. Well, I think it's unbelievable, but I've had a lot of experience through the last 10 years with the Ethics Commission and... Uh, Absolutely, totally worthless. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, they are there in place to cover up uh, corruption of political officials. Um, and that's, that's the appearance that they give. Filing a complaint with them is, is totally useless. You'll get a one-page letter back that will dismiss whatever you have. So, Well, go, go see this and, you know, Leave the people in Virginia to themselves. So, so the governor of the of the uh, state of Virginia has declared a state of emergency ahead of a gun rights rally that's planned for Monday in Richmond. Have you heard anything about this? No, I haven't heard anything about that. But I think so they so it, so then yesterday, I believe it was the FBI arrests three dip craps from some white supremacy group called the base. Doesn't that sound ominous really? for, yeah, for, you know, all, these guys are in a weapons charges, human trafficking, you name it. And so instead of acting a fool, driving from Alabama to, you know, fight for the people's rights in Virginia, go see this movie and, and try to learn something from it. It's a good movie. It is a great movie. And you should know what's going on. You know, the one of the history of, um, is that the last hanging victim recorded was in 1981. 81. In Mobile. In, in Mobile, Alabama. That's right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about Mobile. <laughs> so, uh, and, uh, things, and things that we thought were hung, right? I mean, 
this uh, I-10 $2 billion toll bridge project was supposedly the governor declared it dead, right? So in uh, Interstate 10 Freeway, dubbed the North Bay Express, connecting Virginia Street and Mobile to Daphne without any exit, leading motorists to the Spanish Fort Causeway is under consideration as an alternative to the I-10 Mobile River Bridge project. Is that going to be tolls? They say not. The expressway, which would be a new four-lane highway adjacent to the existing bayway, would be it would be cheaper than the state's two point one billion dollar I ten bridge project, costing around one point two billion. D- don't you feel like the the governor is a used car salesman? <clears throat> First they show show me the car that I really can't afford, and then they show me the. <laughs> Right. We're going to knock a billion off. Yeah. They, that makes it a lot better. Uh, uh, right. I mean, just within a period of, what, four or five months, and they got another uh, project that's a billion less. So you know what really peeves me off about this project? If you're down on the waterfront across from Austell next to the, uh, you know, the $16 billion maritime museum that nobody goes to. Right. So next to that is the cruise terminal parking deck. And right next to it is this old little metal building. Just looks like somewhere you get tetanus or chainsaw massacred. But what it is, it's a, it's a, it was a fish house where people, if they went and caught some speckled trout, they'd come over there and sell them, and then oh, people would come right, there and buy them. Right, I heard this. Story. Well, of course, that's the first damn thing they condemned because they were going to put a bridge pillar right there. So mm-hmm. now the place I've been buying fish for 30 years is out of business. Uh, and, and no bridge. <laughs> what a bunch of bull crap. And and they bought it out from under him too. I don't know whether that gentleman He didn't want to sell it. It I was know. it was a family business for three generations. Yeah, I know he was looking at opening up again. I'm sorry to say I don't know whether he did or not. Go for another one, man. All right. Uh this again is uh in Lanyap. Both of these are written by John uh, Mullen and both of them are related. Uh the first one is this for that. Developer sues Orange Beach over land and cash requirements we talked about this a little bit before this so, is developer so he gave him the property across the street and they had to give him a right of way to the beach uh, along their property line and right. they were supposed to build a beach overwalk and an emergency access lane and put in a fire station and not only did he give oh he gave him land over on cotton bayou too correct that he wants back correct plus this, 400 grand correct and this the city's is. done jack all of any of this, right? Right. That's Turquoise Place Towers, and I believe they're going to be um, uh, building a couple of more of those towers too. But the development fee has not been used to pay for any of the unmanned, like you said, fire station, dune walkover, handicap parking, barbecue grills, public restrooms, and a fishing pier that was promised. Wireman's other federal filing against Park National SE. Southeast uh, Property Holdings and Southeast Property Solutions says that the three Ohio-based entities overcharged Wireman by more than a million on about a $20 million worth of financing to develop it. And uh, uh, the way you get in that situation is you can't do anything but pay it at, the, at that time, and then you got to go back and file a lawsuit to try to get it. So December 12th, filing uh, moved the lawsuit from Baldwin County Judicial Circuit to the federal court. Uh, and like I said, fearing financial retribution and the fees weren't paid, Wireman and his company paid the fees, and then they filed the suit to recover them. Uh, neither defendant has responded to the lawsuits, or and Orange Beach Tony Cannon told NBC 15 the city doesn't uh, speak about pending litigation. But this is, again, about fees and impact fees. And then another article that accompanies that in the same uh, land yap is overcharged and underserved and this is probably uh collateral from this first article the lawsuit claims orange beach misappropriated the impact fees and the uh family the weymas cried foul at more than twenty six hundred dollar fee on the value for land and home based at two hundred and forty three thousand dollars they filed suit and are seeking other uh other people to join in the complaint and the um, 
named as plaintiffs in the lawsuit again are Mayor Tony Cannon and all five of the council. Uh, these impact fees are not being used in the way that they are. The lawsuit claims not only are the impact fees not being used as intended, but the city won't reveal at all how they calculate the city fees and how they are using them. That they should have to do anyway. Another part of the law, the complaint alleges, says cities can only charge these fees when property taxes and other city revenue is not enough to improve the infrastructure, the lawsuit says the city of Orange Beach has more than $50 million in reserves, and they collect over 7% on lodging tax, which is the equivalent of $21 million a year. So you would think that the people wouldn't even have to pay impact fees with that type of reserves and uh income coming in i wonder what their debt service is uh, well that i don't i don't know but i think everybody's going to find out and everybody's going to be that much more curious and i'll bet you on the class action part i'll, I'll say their court pulls in quite a haul uh, i'll say that uh last time i checked the municipal court down there pulled in over three hundred thousand a year yeah and that just you know that can go up or down <laughs> you want to get into the to the big one? Uh, well, we can do that, or let's see. Yeah, we can get into that or any right. one of the others if you want. Why don't you get into the big one? Okay. That don't we have a video related to that? What's that? Now, that's now we don't want to – we just want to superimpose it. This is on uh, – The the court – the when we were in court the other day, Paul. Right, right, right. We right. ended up having – ended up having to go to court on Monday – uh, Baldwin County Circuit Court Judge Clark Stankowski Tuesday ruled in favor uh, of Lanyap quashing subpoenas that sought to undermine the state's shield law, which protects uh, privileged communications. Uh, according to the subpoenas filed last year, those people included Fairhope Mayor Karen Wilson, Attorney Harry Still, consumer advocate and internet publisher Paul Ripp, yours truly, Tuesday, Pittman said he would withdraw subpoenas for steel and rip based on attorney-client privilege, but he pressed Stankowski to uphold the subpoena for Lanyap while uh, mischaracterization of the paper was reporting on the case. Uh, Lanyap's initial report on the Macherry civil case, which we, Rip Report, has published many on, was published on May 8, 2019, more than a week after the lawsuit was filed on April 30th. It was a follow-up report to a separate story uh, published in May. Uh, one, detailing McSherry's criminal conviction for assault that resulted in a 180-day jail sentence, uh, record show uh, which was filed in Fairhope Municipal Court on April 17th. Uh, both these news stories were largely derived from public records, uh, including police reports indicating McSherry had been cited several times over the years on allegations including public intoxication, harassment, domestic violence, and assault. In the current case, McSherry was convicted for pushing Harlan Denardi off the bar stool at the Little Christmas Bar in uh, Fairhope and. We wrote some articles on that. Now, uh, Rob Land, uh, Rob, uh, Holbert with Lanyap uh, is quoted in the end of the article saying, we are glad to see Judge Stankowski has squashed these subpoenas. Even though it is a bit troubling, the court did not immediately recognize the well-established history of the reporter's privilege that serves as the very basis for protecting the investigative journalism critical to unearthing corruption and wrongdoing. Lanyap's co-producer co Rob Holbert said, it's unfortunate Mr. Pittman allowed, was allowed to waste the time and money trying to breach this uh, virtually uh, important privilege so he could conduct a fishing expedition in support of a bizarre unfounded conspiracy. The bizarre unfounded conspiracy is that myself, the mayor, and certain lawyers have it in for McSherry and that there's a conspiracy to go after him. That could not be any further from the truth. We are, I am a consumer advocate and I have advocated for Mr. Nall, who also had a run in with McSherry. And um, 
and the mayor is supposed to accept any complaints from citizens. So now let's be specific. He didn't have a run in. He was convicted of harassing Nall uh, Hollis. That that's correct. And, and he was on probation for it when he knocked Ms. Denardi off a bar stool. Correct. And if that had been any one of us, we'd have gone straight to jail. Exactly. You know. So 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 I'm gonna nutshell uh the argument. Okay. And well, I'm, and now I'm, wait a minute. Well, let me let me see one other thing. Now, okay. Now this goes to court uh, on the criminal part. We'll be in court on like uh, the end of the month. I think it's the twenty third. So you can rest assured we'll bring you up to date on that as it uh, uh, as it goes. This so, is a this 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 bar this location used to be the watering hole for a lot of the politicians like Mr. Burrell and uh, lawyers and a few judges. Since then, they've kind of stopped going there. But uh, uh, how Mr. McSherry could avoid all these uh, issues and still be out of jail, I don't know. So the, so the, uh, the shield law, the right. journalist shield law, there's hardly any case law on it because judges have treated it as sector state, right? I mean, all it's, 50- it's not something that we... We dabble in in all fifty states. So, um, I'll I'll boil it down. So here's my interpretation of what Judge Tankowski said about the Shield Law: that it only protects sources who inf- whose information was published in some manner. So if you give information to the New York Times and they don't use you as a source, you're not covered under the Shield Law. Now, does that make sense? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing makes sense about this whole thing. <laughs> well, and make, maybe he's looking for clarification from the Court of Civil Appeals on this. You know, you, sometimes you put stuff up just to see, make them give you a, a, a decision on it. But um, I can tell you, I'm going to appeal it. Uh, sounds like a pretty obvious. Thing and I th- to me. and I know that the uh, uh, Delaney app said they were in, in, online. Now, I here's so this is one of the greatest resources anybody ever gave me. It's the Law Student Handbook produced by Westlaw. And um, they're a legal research. You pay Westlaw so you can look up cases online. And they also tell you how they've been treated by the courts. And so it's very helpful. Um, But this little book right here has all kinds of things in it. It has the Constitution, all of the amendments, the rules of civil procedure, and the federal rules of evidence, which, of course, Alabama is modeled off of. So I'm going to read to you... um, Rule 401 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, and it is entitled Definition of Relevant Evidence. Relevant evidence means evidence having any tendency to make the existence of a fact that is of consequence to the determination of the action more probable or less probable than it would be without the evidence. And then it goes on to say, Rule 402 says relevant relevant evidence is generally admissible and irrelevant evidence is inadmissible, okay? Mm-hmm. So how in the heck could any of this be relevant to this case? Like that's the that's the it, you got to pass muster on that. <clears throat> but right? It's got to right. be relevant evidence. Right. How in the world could any of this be relevant to anything? Well, the and question that, that's that that was that that was the underlying question to this entire uh, motion to quash hearing. Well, my questions would be: uh, How did this go to the municipal court in Fairhope so many times, and the municipal um, city attorney, and get to this point, and nothing was done ever? This has been going on for years, folks. Not just this last incident, the Nall incident. It's even before then. So if you go on the Lanyap, if you're a subscriber and uh, you go to this article, I believe down at the bottom they have all, uh, is it five PDFs of six, the diff- six. different arrests that Mr. McSherry's had? Right. So it's this is all public. This is all public right. information. Right. This, is, this isn't any inside information that Paul or right. I or anybody else has. These these are public documents. It's in a conspiracy theory, folks. This, this has already happened. Uh, all right. Keep on going. All right. Uh, it's on you. Well, uh, again in Lanyap, John Mullen again. County officials start the site work on the new boat ramp. I know that that's... Uh, 
A lot of people excited about hearing that. The new launch will be located on 48 out acres on the Intercoastal Waterway west of the Foley Beach Express toll. Um, the Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, go, gom, how do you say that? Go Mesa. Go Mesa money from oil and gas leases to pay for the purchase and design the building and the facility. Um, they're going to get $7.5 million from them. Originally, the project was to have uh, 12 launches, parking for 450 boat trailers and 50 additional parking spaces for day-use areas and other amenities. That sounds like a lot. Officials say it's unlikely the Ar Army Corps of Engineers, Coast Guard, or the Gulf Waterway community would issue permits for such a large uh, launch. Volker will be handling that and uh, with the talks and the pro and uh, permits. So looks like that's finally going to get done. The ribbon cutting was done. The county officials went down. And another um, article in Lanyap, the 30-year anniversary of the Weeks Bay Foundation. They've uh, appointed a new director. This is by Gabriel Times. Uh, Connie Whitaker is going to be the new director. In late December, the board also advertised a land coordinator position, which separates duties previously assigned to the director and will give Whitaker a more of an opportunity to increase public awareness and involvement in the foundation's mission. Uh, the land coordinator's position will be responsible for working with the board to identify potential tracks for acquisition, as well as creating management plans, navigating deed and title work, and negotiating closings. Folks, you know, it was Weeks Bay that made the run at the uh, Triangle property to try to make it a conservation easement so now the past director's gone that was involved in that. They got a new director. I hope that's not where they're going, that they're going to try to get the municipal property, which cost us $11.25 million, uh, and we already have as parkland. Uh, we do not need a third party. Fairhope does not need a third party to, muni to manage their municipal land. So the last time a public boat ramp was built, I know that Boggy Point was already there. They renovated it. But uh, I actually was the special project manager for the city of Gulf Shores when we built Canal Park on the other side under the Intracoastal Waterway Bridge. And I can tell you it was a damn booger getting permission from all those different federal agencies. And you're talking about 12 launches and Parking for four hundred and fifty boat trailers. And what, what do you think additional you, spots? How, what do you think the stormwater retention requirements are <laughs> on a parking lot that damn big? It's going half of it's going to be detention area. <coughs> oh, really? No kidding. Well, yeah. All right, Paul, keep going. It's all you, baby. Okay. Uh, the Beltway beat in Lanyap. This is by Jeff Poor. The wrong reason to oppose medical marijuana legislation. <clears throat> this is uh, in response to the attorney general who's come out in opposition to any uh, medical marijuana or, um, uh, or recreational. The state of Alabama has a long... And st the, the thing that gets me with this is that Marshall is putting forth as his reason uh, two things. Uh, one, he compares opioid addiction to marijuana, which, you know, uh, you lose me right there. There is no comparison, all right? And also, uh, he cites a conflict with federal law. But the state of Alabama has a long and storied history of acting in defiance of federal law, going back to the Civil War, one of the most historic on the wrong side of history, moments in Alabama was former Governor George Wallace's standing in the schoolhouse door, okay? And one of the more recent examples of the state willing to go against federal law was last year's passage of the abortion ban, which was a state law meant to challenge the federal law on the land determined in the U.S. Supreme Court 1973 Roe versus Wade. So 
I don't know. Uh, you know, you have a commission that's being set up for the medical marijuana. Medical. There are 36 states right now that have some sort of uh, medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. I can tell you that the Veterans Association uh, is pushing for it. And I can tell you the hospital that I go to, it's quite common for uh, veterans and doctors uh to be discussing medical marijuana. And we have veterans in Alabama that are going to Florida and other states that have medical marijuana. So uh, I I just wish the Attorney General was uh, not in the dark ages on this issue, and I think more and more is going to come out about it. So we'll just see. All right, so I got one thing I want to talk about, going back to the uh, Jack Wilson complex. Right. That Reigns thinks I must possess because I have firearms. Um, so the Millery police chief goes on the internet and says, Hey guys, I'm going to be doing a uh, church training SWAT team academy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Oh my goodness, how many people will get shot up in a church? Random gunfire. Um, anyway. Maybe it's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad idea. I don't know. Um, I, I, and, of course, we talked last time. There's a new proposal to say that you can absolutely carry a gun into a church where now it's considered a kind of like a commercial space. Whoever owns the space can say, you can't bring a gun in here. Right? Yeah. So that's on the table. And um, so one other thing I wanted to talk about, and I certainly did not do this to – blow anything up i was waiting on 60 minutes to come on and the ball game was running over so i was kind of digging on youtube and i uh went to see if there if there was anything on there about the baymanette police department and uh debbie williams did a story for uh wkrg channel 5 news back on uh, april 12th 2018 and um they had actually gone down <laughs> in uh uh down here by Rock Hole uh, on Newport Road and put up web cameras hooked up to cell phones and just surveilled these people all the time. And I, and you guys remember the uh, last ep- or a few episodes ago where we showed the BS police uh, right. action of the week. Right. So anyway, I shared this thing at whatever time it was, 6 o'clock at night, it gets shared 219 times in about 20 minutes. And, of course, the chief of police gets on Facebook and says, well, I, you know, I, I usually get on here to welcome, say, say happy birthday or whatever, but I have to defend my officers against this uh, keyboard, he, uh, keyboard warrior. That's mm-hmm. what it was. Keyboard warrior? Key, keyboard warrior. Okay. Now, so here's the thing, Paul. I'm down in the gutter every day. I'm not behind the keyboard. I'm in court all week. Um, I have a podcast. I tell people exactly where I stand on things, and I can't believe Rain's in here. We're going to do a follow-up on this, believe you me. But these people around here who are just fine giving up their privacy for security, we're at loggerheads. Right. I'll never agree to it. Um, just like I won't agree to any kind of uh, infringement on the First Amendment. So, Reigns, do your damn homework. We're going to talk about this next time. <laughs> it's on you, man. All right. Uh, Alabama, Jason Johnson, Lanyap, Alabama Power. Environmentalists say new gas will prolong carbon emissions. And this pro- proposal involves the uh, fifth gas turbine to be placed at uh, Plant Berry. You know, we've been talking about that in the cold ash. Uh, a good bit of... Now, most of these articles, you know where I'm reading you part of these articles and everything, I can't do the article entire justice, so I certainly encourage you to get a land yap and read the whole thing if uh, what I'm outlining on the article interests you. Uh, the With Alabama Power, a good bit of the proprietary information is redacted in the public version of the Alabama Power's petition, go figure, including statements showing what some individual projects within the plan might cost as well as some of the calculations used to demonstrate why the increase in reserve capacity is necessary. Uh, Stephen Stetson, a representative of the Sierra Club, 
Beyond Coal campaign, says in addition to the process of fracking itself, the potential for methane leaks and other short-term environmental problems, the construction of new gas-burning infrastructure extends the use of fossil fuels decades into the future. Since uh, intervening into the petition to the PSC, the Sierra, the Sierra Club has also pitched the argument that betting on gas is not the best economic decision for Alabama Power as the cost of wind and solar energy production continue to drop. Stetson right. argues... But in the meantime, we have to produce power, and the idea of using natural gas coming right out of the bottom of Mobile Bay as opposed to digging up coal in, I don't know, they still have coal fields in Jasper. That's about the closest place I know of that has coal. And shipping it here in a rail container, knocking half of it off in the river when they're trying to get it off a barge. I mean, I, I don't see where it's a terrible idea. Well, I mean, the, the anything point, you were going to do there, the Sierra Club would be against it. Oh, well, I don't know about that. But look, the cost of wind and solar energy production are continuing to drop. All right, Paul. So here, so I can't believe I'm having to tell you this. Uh, all right. The the uh, Dangling County Commission 2010 to 2018. Right. Guess what they banned? Solar windmills. <laughs> you can't build a damn windmill over 50 feet tall in Baldwin County. They'll arrest you. That's a bird killer, probably. Oh, you know how many beautiful birds get killed? I mean, hell, people hit. 500 birds get killed by cars on the Bayway every day. Well, you know, the Sierra Club does a lot of work. Well, the Sierra Club needs to work on the county commission and get them to repeal that. Uh, well, they're Because the causeway seems like a really damn good place to me to put a big wind farm. Well, that that's a good point, too. But they've also challenged the way that the uh, Public Service Commission has handled some parts of the process, specifically objecting to the decision in October to grant Alabama Power's request to start, listen to this, to start preliminary construction on the new natural gas unit at Plant Berry while the commission is deciding whether they're going to approve it. Now, let me tell you what that means to taxpayers. That means with that authorization, ratepayers will be on the hook for those costs, whether the project is approved or not. Although the Public Service Commission may be likely to approve Alabama Power's petition, it is not a done deal, and we're going to intervene with all the power of the Sierra Club, Stetson said. We want to present the best possible case so we can show that they don't need this. And, uh, you know, I can tell you that uh, Alabama Power gets something in their mind. They don't like looking at anything else other than their plans. And... If that coal ash dam ever breaks up there, I can assure you people it's going to be worse than BP. Well, we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I understand that we absolutely need reliable power, and I don't care what you wanted to do, the Sierra Club wouldn't, wouldn't be for it. Um, so another thing from AL.com, uh, from the from the guys at Reckon, and, and I, I typically like their – like their stuff, and we've shared some things on here. But they had a recent article, The 20 Movers and Shakers of 2020. Have that, you seen that list? Is that Josh Moon? I think that's Josh Moon, right? Hey, no, this was this was AL.com. Oh, oh, okay. All right, I don't know who wrote that. Right. Twinkle, Kavanaugh, Wiley, Blankenship. Movers and Shakers, huh? <laughs> this is Alabama, though. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, roadblocks in the way of progress is right. what they are. Anyway, I'm not saying everybody on the list, just these two people I'm familiar with. And uh, uh, <laughs> I could uh, I, I could retitle that article three or four times and frame it, and uh, we'd have a good time with that. Mm -hmm. All right, Paul, wrap it up for us. All right. Uh, next article is Trading Blows. That's uh, Mobile's aircraft maker announces expansion as uh, Politico's business leaders fight the tariffs. Um, the Are you talking about Airbus? Uh, correct. Over the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce and other stakeholders have put forth an effort to prevent the administration of President Donald J. Trump from slapping tariffs on the European aircraft manufacturer Airbus, 
whose final assembly line in Mobile now employs over a thousand people uh, and is growing. Um, the these tariffs have a ripple effect all through uh, the um, uh, aircraft industry. In addition to the operations in Mobile, the France-based company has an extensive presence throughout the U.S. It currently employs approximately 4,000 Americans at 38 locations in 16 states. In the last three years alone, Airbus has spent nearly $50 billion in the U.S., with more than 400 U.S. suppliers supporting uh, those operations. Uh, the uh, now we have three. Let's see. There's the letter notes. Hey. more than six hundred employees call uh, Baldwin County home. So let's talk about this. All right, Airbus is who? Uh, European Aerospace Corporation. Uh, correct. Okay, and for years and years, especially in France, they subsidized that. That is the Airbus. Problem. That is the argument. Okay, correct. and and so and while Boeing had to compete in a in that, I mean, you know, the guy sweeping the floors up there in Seattle's making how much an hour? Twenty five dollars an hour, <clears throat> right? Well, Airbus, the reality lies in the hands of the White House. She said They're, we're trying to head it off, so uh, we don't have this impact. This is Billy Joe uh, Underwood. Uh, they're working on this and they're trying to fight off the tariffs. Hey, Paul, These, how how long's Airbus been in Mobile? Um. I'm not really sure. How many Tier 1 suppliers are located in Baldwin County? I don't think any. How many Tier 2 suppliers are located in Baldwin I, County? I don't know what's located in Baldwin County. It's always amazed me that uh, you've got Airbus, Austell, uh, all these you know big manufacturing and large plants over in the uh, Mobile County area, and yet we don't see anything happening here. You know, the county's still trying to recruit... Uh, an anchor manufacturer for the 3,000 acre uh, mega site. Hey, they got a sign on it. <coughs> well, that's great. About a month ago, they finally put a sign up. Now, that was uh, that initially was purchased for $32 million in 2012 and is currently undergoing a $7 million infrastructure investment courtesy of the Alabama Department of Commerce. Now, the thing that gets me is we're going into the ninth year of the mega site. They're doing a seven million dollar. We're going to have forty one million in it. Correct, and that and and the infrastructure investment is being done eight years after. But Paul, the purchase, all of the ripple effects of corruption that this one purchase created. Yeah, it, it's given. Well, like I said, there are three things we'll spend unlimited amounts of money on: uh, military slash law enforcement, education, and economic development. So as long as you hang one of those three things on it, you can spend all the money in the co in the city coffers, and that's what they did with this economic development project up here. They bought those bungalows. They bought a, a building in downtown Baymanette. Um, by the way, uh, North Bowen Utilities was my landlord and asked me to leave, evicted me. And, of course, um, when I asked, I said, hey, that's no problem. I'd just like a copy of the minutes. And they said, well... They didn't make the decision in a meeting. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure that's how this works. They got to make decisions. They got to be in a, in a meeting to make a decision. So, mm -hmm. so well, anyway, well, um, uh, uh, gave Gabe, them a lot of cover. Gabe, uh, Gabe Times also contributed to that article, and it's called uh, Trading Blows. You might want to go look at it. And a related one was written by uh, Rob Holtworth under Damn the Torpedoes. Airplane parts, tariffs, and had bad business for Bama. Uh, even as Airbus announces an extension, uh, an expansion that will bring 450 new jobs and increase production, the shadow of another senseless tariff has taken the shine off of the apple. The complaints against Airbus have always been, and this is what you were talking about, is the receiving of the EU countries' uh, subsidies. But think back how uh, they were able to steal away the massive $35 billion tanker contract that had been awarded to Northrop Grumman and Airbus, which would have put Brooklyn Field uh, way up there. Boeing protested after they won the bid. Boeing protested and asked for a do-over uh, 
until they were awarded the contract and a decision that stunned both the industry insiders and the local teams. That you know what you call it when together. it stuns everybody? Uh, Corruption. That, That's right. what you call it. Exactly. So my uh, Boeing, you know, I, I, of course, Boeing's got some very serious problems now, but uh, Boeing certainly wouldn't be my favorite. But as a result, the city of Mobile and Mobile and Baldwin County commissioners have drafted resolutions asking the president not to include airport airplane parts in the tariffs uh, aimed at the AU. I'm sure Trump's going to be reading that. Uh, some con- some candidates for the U.S. House and U.S. Senate are far more interested in preserving the perception of close ties to Trump rather than protecting the interests of the people living in this district. The latest talk of slapping a 100% tariff on airplane parts bound for Mobile's Airbus U.S. manufacturing facility is making life pretty tough on those politicians who have decided their election strategy to hire office must include massive amounts of embarrassing uh, supplication to President Trump. So these tariffs, when you hear these tariffs, these no, tariffs I'm are, Trumpier. These, no, I'm Trumpier. No, I'm Trumpier. Well, these these tariffs, uh, they're affecting us here locally. So you know, when you hear the tariffs with China and everything, you think you're not involved. There are tariffs on these airplane parts. We are involved directly. Our cities, our communities, and our workers. Over 600 people make uh, Baldwin County home. So I was in the district attorney's office the other day, and there was a little pile of cards that they had, little laminated cards, and I guess they were for law enforcement officers. I picked a few up, and um, it gives you, you know, it's a rudimentary guide to is the person I'm talking to a prostitute or is she someone who's been hum- who's the victim of human trafficking? Mm-hmm. And they say, you know, if they don't have control of their own documents, they don't have their passport, they don't have money on them, they don't have their purse... Uh, they're they're in a position where they're locked in. You know, they're they're staying in a dormitory type situation where um, there are bars on the windows. Um, anyway, I just wanted to lay that out there so you could lead into your other story about sex trafficking. Oh, right. There's the article again in Lanyap: victims of sexual trafficking in South Alabama to tell their stories. This is by Lynn Olchu, and I believe Lynn is also with the. Um, Social media site. Uh, so I'm going to tell mine. This one time, Paul said, "Hey, do you want to go to the floor, of Bama?" I'm what? kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd that go from? <laughs> but anyway, Lynn. Uh, uh, Lynn is also affiliated with Fair Hope Now, which is a Facebook site, and I've seen her posting this on that and uh, on that, her site. And we've also. Um, Uh, shared it on the RIP Report and our site's Backstory Podcast. January is the National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. I know a lot of people in this area don't think that, uh, you know, uh, sex trafficking is uh, in this area, but you might be surprised that uh, Mardi Gras is the busiest time of the year with men coming to Mobile from across the country. The celebration brings out the best and worst in people. I didn't sleep through those weeks, was told, to uh, during the Mardi Gras. It was big money, but the girls that are working never saw it. Now, there's several women that have come forward and are telling their stories and trying to get this out about what a problem this is, and these women are sharing their stories to raise awareness on sex trafficking uh, is happening here. To, and to save other uh, women and children from becoming victims and talk about how uh, the community can help in this issue. Now, these stories of these survivors are going to be shared Saturday, January 25th at 7 p.m. at the People's Room in Mobile. Tickets are $30, and all proceeds are going to go to the Rose Center. Tickets are available on everbright.com. Uh, a lot of times you don't want to see these problems, but they exist and they need to be addressed. This is a, a chronic problem in cities all across the United States. So I was interested in this um, a few months ago, and I reached out. It looks like the best resource is um, a place called the Well House up in Birmingham. It's a shelter 
for traffic trafficking I, I, victims. I've heard of that, yeah. And uh, they're the I think the lady I talked to whose name was Carolyn Potter. Um, but anyway, I want to give you all a phone number if you if you need help and have been trafficked. The number is one eight hundred nine nine one zero nine four eight. Or if you know anyone that is involved in trafficking. Yeah, tell somebody. Right. If you suspect it. Right, If right. there's something you feel uncomfortable about in your neighborhood. Okay, well, this is number 18. And number 19, we are hoping to be in our studio in Daphne. We shall be. Which we are going to And the reason for. we're not there now is, of all the damn hang-ups, it's the internet company. Oh, oh, that right. doesn't surprise me in the least. Yeah, Mr. Trey, we'll, we'll get you hooked up in two or three weeks, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That does me any good. Oh, uh, right. Well, we can't get on the internet uh, uh, and service and fair hope we'd be here for a month. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. All right. Well, that's number 18 in the can. I hope you guys had a good time and we will see you later.